Our scripture comes to us this morning from the Gospel of Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 10 to 17. Listen for the word of God. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with the spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he, he laid his hand on her, immediately she stood up straight and began to praise God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which you work ought to be done. Come on one of those days to be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think that we got it fixed, so I won't have to stay behind the pulpit. I, 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 well, maybe not. I remember early on in my ministry when I, I began to, to move out from behind the pulpit, and I was serving a church, and there was a lady who said, well, what am I going to have to do to make you stay still? Okay, we're going we're gonna to go back to the pulpit, so. Well, I guess this is what we do to make me stand still. In, the, in Jesus' day, the law played a, an amazingly important role. It was one thing that people would look to. It was something that they searched to find great meaning for their life. They, they went to the law to find that which could give their life a sense of direction. And the law played a, a particularly important role for one important reason. You see, up to a few hundred years before uh, the time of Christ, most religions were centered on coming to a temple to worship. And for Jerusalem, they had a temple where everyone came to worship. That was much like all the other religions that were around. And they had the law of what was a right life to live, how one was to, to keep their life ordered. But something happened. It was called the Babylonian exile. You see, they came in to the land of Israel, and they had this amazing way that they dealt with countries that they occupied. What they would do is they would take the leadership of that nation. They would take all those leaders and send them to exile in another country. So if you were from Israel, you went to Babylon. If you were in Babylon, you went another place. They did this all over. They, they took the leaders into exile into other regions. And in doing so, they took away the power of the people to organize. But what happened during that time was an amazing thing. A religion that had been centered around going to the temple to worship God had to adapt and change. And you know what it was that they were able to take with them? It was the law. They carried the law with them. It was something that they were able then to place their connection to. The practice of the law became the most important thing about life. It was during that time they developed what they called the synagogue. The synagogue was not one temple to go and worship at, but the synagogue was literally dozens of places to go. In each community, a place to go to worship God, to celebrate. But it turned the, the life of Israel a bit differently. 
Not only was it a place to worship, but it was a place to go and learn and to study. That's when the law became such an important part. Because they may be able to take the synagogue away. They may be able to take the temple away. But they cannot take the law which we hold in our hearts away. And so the law began to take on a stronger and stronger role in the practice of religion. After all, it was these ways that would keep us in a right relationship with God. In fact, it was so strong that, um, and that the group that we refer to in the New Testament as the Pharisees soon began, those were the practicers, uh, practicers of the law coming out of the synagogue, far outnumbered those who were referred to as the Sadducees, who were about the practice of worship of God in the temple. In fact, that was the group that Jesus, in a way, maybe found himself most comfortable with. The conversations Jesus has about the role and the place of the law seem to be those of one person who fits within that community of people, often taking differing views. Like today, different people approach the law with a different sense of view. There were two communities within the Pharisees. You could just keep breaking this down further and further if you want to. One was called the Hillel community. The other was called the Shammai. The Hillel community emphasized not the letter of the law, but the intent of the law. Most of Judaism that we see today came out of the Hillel community. And then the Shammai were those who were not focused on the intent of the law, but the letter of the law. We will do exactly what the law says and requires. Those are what you see in more conservative and not, well, not conservative within Judaism, but the ultra-Orthodox movements that follow the letter of the law even to this day. So when Jesus comes to the synagogue, he's coming as one of those who makes that his regular practice. And as he's there, he sees a woman, a woman who has been bent over by the weight of life, a woman who has struggled to hold herself straight, a woman who comes to the synagogue for 18 years unable to stand tall, a woman who's felt that weight. I saw an interesting program, someone who was really into these uh, things on the internet called TED Talks. Maybe some of you have seen them. And there was one of the TED Talks, I wish I remembered the, the speaker's name, uh, who, as she was uh, talking about it, she said, we have just a little bit of a tendency to pull ourselves in in life, little by little, and that what we need to do is to find a way to expand ourselves out into the world. She said, if you're going to do a presentation before people, before you do it, stretch yourself out for a minute or two before you go to expand your presence and your sense of confidence. And what I understood in that moment is how right she was. Little by little, we feel weighted down by the things in our life, holding us down, hunching us over. Sometimes small things, sometimes big things. We worry over finances. We worry over relationships. We worry about our children. Our children worry about us. We fill ourselves with worry, and its weight is heavy. We can't quite appreciate it because it just adds a little at a time. But she is finding herself bent over by the burden of such a weight. Sometimes we can't even see it among those who we deal with, but their lives are burdened, held by such a weight. You might have heard about the fellow who kept going around town and asking people, do you know how much a grudge weighs? No one seemed to know. Finally, someone asked him, well, why do you want to know? And he said, I've been thinking about carrying one, and I just wondered how much it weighed. Sometimes we're not so intentional about what we carry. We just take it, we pick it up, We'll add that grudge to the chip on our shoulder, and soon we are weighted down. 
I remember when I was a boy, I don't remember him making a big deal of it, and I don't remember the occasion that it was on. But I remember my father telling me that the way we go through life, it's kind of like we have a backpack on our shoulders. And in there are different things that we carry. Some things we've chosen to carry, others that other people have placed on our shoulders in the backpack, and they can weigh us down. He said, every once in a while, you need to stop and take the pack off and look inside and decide if you really want to be carrying those things. Wasn't until I was adult, man, I filed that away. I forgot it for 20 years. And then on a day when I needed to hear it, it popped back up. So parents, when you teach your children and it appears that they don't really hear it, maybe they did. Maybe it's filed away for that time when they're going to need it. And then it will come forward. She was a person bent over by the weight of her world. And can you imagine going around the world only seeing the feet of other people? It's all she could see, her own and the feet of others. And then as she's there, in that moment, Jesus... His gaze comes upon her. He sees her. He sees her bent and weighted down. Does she really need to be carrying such a weight? Does she need to be burdened in her life? I wonder how long Jesus watched her before he drew attention to her, calling her to stand up, that she was healed. He does. He speaks to her. He tells her that she's set free, that she's able to stand tall. Stand up. You've been set free. And in doing so, I know she hears the words, but can't you imagine the pause between hearing them and deciding whether she will actually act upon it or not. He's offering her a gift, and will she receive it? Or will she live more comfortably in the role that she's known for 18 years? It's all she's known for 18 years. No one has expected much of her. No one has expected really anything of her. If she stands tall, will their expectations change? Unburdened by such a weight? Will she now have to be responsible? I imagine in that moment her mind was filled with many things, but what seemed overwhelming was the de desire to be set free, to be able to stand tall, to be able to be proud again. Can you imagine that moment for her pushing herself up to finally be able to see again? To look out in a world and to see people's faces and their eyes, not eyes cast down when you might happen to catch a glimpse from being bent over, but eyes that look full in the face. Her life has changed. Remember that old song in the church? Burdens down, Lord, burdens down. Since I laid my burdens down. I'm so happy, so very happy. Since I laid my burdens down. She's laid her burdens down and now is able to, be able, is now, is able to stand tall. Set free from all that would hold her back. Bound for 18 years. And now, tall. One of the real gifts that uh, received in my life and time in seminary was to get to know a, a woman named Helen Pearson. Uh, Helen wrote a book titled, uh, Do What You Have the Power to Do. And it was focused on the stories of several New Testament women who had encounters with Jesus that decide to do what they have the power to do. And then a chapter reflecting on this scripture, she tells a story about a young girl in Atlanta. 
She titles this section, A Letter from Jonella, and I'll share it with you. Janella was 12 years old. She was the victim of oppressive circumstances, inadequate health care, improper diet, poverty, racism, and child abuse. She moved frequently from place to place and from school to school. When I met Janella, I was volunteering in her learning disability classroom. Janella had been attending this school for over six years, or for six months, I'm sorry. Uh, she had never spoken a word in her teacher's presence, nor would she respond to any request to read or write. I sat beside her day after day at her desk. Sometimes I talked to her. Mostly I just was there, present. Occasionally, occasionally Janella would haltingly whisper something to me, but she would not pick up either a pencil or crayon. One day, as I was leaving, Jonella ran after me. She took my hand and kissed it and thrust a wrinkled piece of paper at me. Jonella never came back to the school, but years later, I remember her. I cannot forget, for she gave me one of the most precious gifts I've ever received. It was a letter written in big, bold, bright orange letters, Janella's favorite color. Dear Miss Pearson, I, uh, I know you like butterflies and rainbows. Now I like them too. When you came to my class, nobody ever talked to me or nothing. Nobody chose me. Nobody touched me. Nobody called me by name. I was invisible to most everybody, but you sat with me, close in my seat. You talked with me, not past me. You touched me, and it felt good to have someone touch me. When you say my name, I am not invisible anymore. I am me. I, don't, I didn't understand about butterflies and rainbows at first, but now I do. My heart has helped open my eyes, and I see butterflies and rainbows in lots of places now. I even feel safe to tell you I love you. Janella. What's amazing is people are bent over by weight, by things that hold them back. In so many ways, we, we can, can't even imagine people who even seem to stand tall. We don't understand the weight that they carry. And we as a church who, as people, have been set free from that, set free from the burdens and the weights that have been placed upon us, we have the power to reach out into other people's lives and to be a witness of change, to help them stand tall. That's what Helen did for Janella. She helped her to stand tall. She gave her power. She gave her strength. And that's something each of us must have in our lives. The question is, whenever that option is before us, why would someone hold so tightly to such a trivial understanding of the law and not allow her to stand tall? Why would the leader of the synagogue want this woman to be bound and not be set free? Her being healed does not change anything for him, except maybe that there's a power that he does not control. I think maybe he responds in such a way in his mind to defend the holy. We set the law as the way in our life to keep us on the right path. So if we live in a lawless world, everybody goes every which direction. And yet, such a law can be used as a weapon to hold back. It's hard to imagine. And if 
It's okay for her to be healed on the Sabbath, and we set aside the law in that case. When else might it be okay to set aside the law? If it, things have really changed, then that's a scary idea. It's a scary idea for him because if God is interacting in our world and the old rules no longer apply, then I don't know how to live in this world. I suspect that's why he lives with that fear, gripped, held back. If she can stand tall, then my world can change too. And he didn't want that to happen. I don't know if that's why, but I suspect it's true. Because sometimes, even the world we know, we would rather have than the one we don't quite know yet. In the life of the church, we, we deal with all kinds of ways that people are held back in their lives. And I don't usually address current issues in the life of the church in a sermon. Uh, but this week, there's something that happened I kind of feel like I have to. Um, this week, uh, I think a misguided person sent uh, two ignorant and threatening and anonymous letters that, among other things, tried to exploit a difference of opinion between myself and, and Garrett. And in, do, in doing so, it was a rather threatening letter to, to Garrett and his family. Uh, such letters have no place in the church. I think the church can be strengthened by differing ideas. I tend to be a pretty upfront, open person. So I tend to share ideas, and if people have differing ideas, I'm not really challenged by that. It does not bother me. People can think differently. And I think that strengthens the church if we have differing ideas. But having differing ideas requires maturity. Maturity to be able to allow others to see things differently. If I had to limit the world to those who thought like me, I'd, I'd be pretty alone. In fact, Angie and I tend to differ on many things, maybe more these days than at earlier times in our life. We hold differing views and ideas about things. But one thing I want to make absolutely clear is I support Garrett and the programs of our children and youth ministries completely. We're doing fabulous things. If you just see a little bit of what's happening, it's amazing because Lives are changed, and children are learning. The last thing I want to say about that is that it's clear to me the person who sent the letters is being burdened down by quite a bit in their life. There's a weight that does not allow them to stand tall and proud, and I hope that person would reach out to me, because just like the woman who was bent over for 18 years, they too can be set free and to stand tall once again. The burden that they're carrying might, might be so heavy that they can only see the ground in front of them. But that's not who God has designed them to be. It's time for them, as it's time for each of us, to be, to be set free so that we can look out in the bright sunshine of the world around us that God has called us to live in. It's amazing. It's full of goodness. And when we can allow ourselves to look up, we receive that gift. She's able to stand tall as we are able to stand tall because Jesus stepped out and reached into her life. There's an African proverb that says that as long as one person cannot stand tall, none of us can. As long as one of us is bent over, we are all bent over. So what happens to her when she is able to stand tall is not a private moment for her. It's not an act of individual healing for her. It is a communal act. It is a public act that not only changes her world, but everyone's world. 
She is set free. And we all get to celebrate. We all get to live in that joy because she is no longer burdened down. When we set our burdens down, we're set free. May we all live in that freedom. Amen. Thank you.